Hey everybody, this is Jurgen the Badass Homesteader, and it's been a busy few days. I've been in training with GIS, which is an acronym for Geographical Information Systems. It's just a fancy way of saying overlaying data on top of a map. Think about it, when you go to Google Maps and you click a little button for traffic, that in essence is GIS. Starting off, one of the tools that I've been using a lot recently is CalTopo, or sometimes called SARTopo. Uh, CalTopo is started with the California wildfires, um, and then the same individual started SARTopo, which is search and rescue topographs. Um, it's a great free tool. Um, I've been using it for hiking. Um, you could use it if you're hunting. You can make custom maps and then do custom overlays. So let's say you start with a topo map and then overlay maybe satellite imaging or open maps. And open maps might have trails on them. It could have um, streets. You could also overlay a um, old topograph that had maybe some old fire roads on it which aren't on new maps and then you could draw and do all this custom stuff it's a really great tool and then you can click a button and do a pdf export and you can have that out in the field what i've been also doing recently is exporting that gpx file and then uploading it into my phoenix watch so i know exactly where i am or where i need to go it's been a great tool check it out the next topic that we were talking about was lat long versus UTM versus US National Grid. I know a lot of people are going towards US National Grid and that's mainly been because of FEMA using it after things like the Hurricane Katrina. The benefit of US National Grid is it's easier to figure out if you're off. Lat longs are, can be really confusing and you get a couple digits wrong, you'll be off by miles. US National Grid, it starts at a higher level, which what they call a grid zone designation. Then it moves down to a 100,000 meter square, and then it moves down to even smaller being a grid coordinate. So you could have maybe, let's say, a couple digits wrong in your grid coordinate, but because your grid zone and your square identification Vacation is correct, you're in the ballpark. Um, it's interesting too because you can problem solve a little bit bigger, a little bit better, I should say. I noticed they gave us a drill and they had the wrong um, square identification on it. And when I looked at what grid zone it was in, it was easy to tell that there was something going wrong with the square identification. Another topic that we talked about was minimum essential data sets. It would be a hard drive or a thumb drive that you would bring with you to a scene. So it would have all of your maps and um, files or reports that you need on scene. I thought this would be also very beneficial on a preparedness side. Think about having a thumb drive just in my man purse, and it would have personal files on it. It would maybe have a map book on there, and then part of, I know specifically with my thumb drive that I use, part of it's also a bootable Linux computer. So I can go onto anyone's computer, power that machine down, plug in my thumb drive, boot the machine up, and I can boot to the thumb drive. So that computer is really just a display, and none of my files are going on that computer. If you wanted some more, um, privacy in that situation. They brought up this interesting organization called Air Bears. It is um, a network of volunteer uh, RC pilots that are de dedicating some of their time to help with local authorities that are dealing with a disaster or a search and rescue. So that was pretty interesting to hear that they're starting to use drones to help fight fires or to help find individuals. People were throwing out terms related to disaster types, one through five. And if you haven't heard about this, it's kind of interesting so that everyone is on the same uh, definitions when they speak about topics. And I don't know if this was brought up after 9-11 or I don't know if this was brought up after Hurricane Katrina or if it was brought up through Homeland Security. But think about this. The smaller the number, the bigger the problem is. So and Type 5, the incident can be easily handled with one or two assets um, with a single resource and I think it's about six personnel. And type 1 being the most complex situation that we could possibly have, that's requiring national resources. 
another thing that was interesting here was open data sets. And there's a lot of different states, counties, even national open data sets. One that they showed us was the Homeland Infrastructure Foundation Level Data, um, H-I-F-L-D. And it's interesting, you go onto the website, you type in, let's say, cell tower data, because maybe that last lost person was using their cell phone. So you could throw that information onto a map, and they already have a data set that you don't need to recreate any stuff. So um, the little description that they have on the website specifically for HIFLD was, um, the site provides national geospatial data within the, the public open domain. And that can be useful to support community preparedness, resilience, um, research, and any number of things. And that data can be exported in CSV, KML, um, Shapefile. So that's a really good tool. And then for any of you nerds out there that really want to get deep, we were also using something called ArcGIS. And if you are a volunteer or just for personal, not gonna use it for commercial at all, or government work, you can get a personal license for a hundred bucks. You can go to the website, I'll leave a link in the description. And you can do a lot of interesting things on that thing. And the, one of the things I thought could be really useful was web apps. You can go on there and make a web application, let's say a clue log. So you'll have uh, what kind of clue, you can also upload a picture, but then it'll also put the GPS data from your cell phone onto a little map. And then that way at the search and rescue EOC, they have a log with geospatial information of every single one of those clues. So think about that. The incident commander could do a lot of um, planning based off that information that's coming in from the field. Well, everybody, it was a great couple days of training with GIS. My brain is hurting. I need a couple days off just to relax and really let all that information sink in and how I might use it in the future. I know one takeaway for me was I also noticed that with wildland firefighting that they have a GIS, a GIS class. And then I asked my crew boss if I could get nominated to go to that class in May. So that's something else I'm working on. Maybe I'll be able to help and use some of this information when we're fighting wildland firefights. So everybody, this is Jurgen the Badass Homesteader. Peace.